So I heard about a Sunday school teacher. She was asking her second graders if uh, anyone knew a name for God. And uh, she was thinking things like, you know, um, the Lord or Almighty. And there was just a really long silence. No one said anything. Then finally, one little boy says, Howard. <laughs> and the teacher goes, Howard? And she goes, he said, the little boy says, yeah, you know, like, Howard be thy name. <laughs> Start, grab your Bible, if you have it, on your phone, if you have it. We're going to do our Wesley prayer, and we'll kick this morning off. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praise for you. Criticize for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O wonderful and holy God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours, so be it. And this covenant with which we have made on earth, that it also be made in heaven. Amen. Thank you for that. When I was in my early 20s, um, I was stationed over in Hawaii, and I used to love to race um, Hobie Cats. And uh, every Thursday night, we raced in Kaneohe Bay, Oahu. And if you don't know where that is, it's the hammerhead breeding grounds of the world. I did mention I was young. I was in my 20s. And uh, before the race, all of us captains, we'd draw a name out of a hat for who was going to be our crew member at that point in time. And, and I can still remember my very first race very vividly. I drew a name out of the hat, and it was a, a Hawaiian local and the first thing he said was, oh no. <laughs> now, oh no is not what you think. Oh no is a Hawaiian word that means the best. Um, the wahoo fish in, in Hawaii, it's considered the best tasting fish, and the Hawaiians call it oh no. So that, that really got me excited. It's like, this Hawaiian guy, he's all excited to be sailing with me. We started getting a little cocky, talking a little smack. We're oh no, we're going to beat everybody. Well, to make a long story short, it, uh, we came in last. <laughs> and we were like an hour behind the last boat last. <laughs> That's what we're doing. That's not what we looked like. <laughs> Most of the time, our was underwater called turtled and you have to climb on it and get it back upright it was my first time racing so the next week rolled around and they got to draw, uh, draw a crew member's name again and uh, this time it was a holly boy like me a, a white boy and the uh, first thing he said was oh no <laughs> and i was all excited i went hoorah and he goes no i said oh no <laughs> We didn't win that race either. <laughs> and as you can imagine, Ono became my new nickname that I've had for 40 years. When I first met Becky, I was introduced to her as Ono. And I quickly had to explain to her, no, that's Hawaiian for the best. <laughs> How about all of you? Do you have a, uh, a nickname that describes your character? One of the things I learned first thing when I got to Texas is that when a couple finds out that they're going to have a baby, they spend the next six months trying to figure out the best rodeo rider name. <laughs> like Blaze or Huck or Rhett for the boys. And for the girls, you got Reno and Remy or Chase. So I have to ask the question, what happened to that boy named Flint? who grows up not wanting anything to do with horses or cowboy hats. What do you think life was like for that boy named Flint who wants to play clarinet in a marching band? 
He's going to get one heck of a ribbing, isn't he? High school and junior high school, that's breeding grounds for the cruel kids. Am I right? <laughs> Plead the fifth. I showed you the video of that Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. And for the visitors, see, it comes all back around again. So in the, in the, in the story, you know, the, the father knows he's not going to be around, so he names his son Sue to make him tough, and it worked. He grows up a scrapper who's angry, and he's, and he's determined to find his father, and he's going to rough him up so that, uh, you know, for vengeance for calling him Sue. And sometimes when we get named by our parents, it's it's interesting name, or a, a formal family, Winston, or Camellia. You know, we, we inherit names, and then sometimes names are just made up. I read of a girl whose mother named her Felony. That's Felony with a PH. I'm pretty sure that when she grows up, the chances are good she's going to have a Felony with an F. But let's pray she doesn't. In ancient times, parents didn't name their kids right away. First of all, they had to make sure they were going to survive. But then secondly, they wanted a name, so to speak. They, they wanted to see what the child's characteristics were. So that's why in the Bible, it's so important to understand the translations of the names. And many times the Bibles will tell you it's such and such, and it means this. It's so important that you understand that. When you read a name in Hebrew, you're actually reading a description. So when, when Jesus was calling his first two disciples... He said, hey, Manly, get your brother, the listener, and come follow me. Andrew, the Manly, Simon, the listener, who later became Peter, the rock. And I think it's safe to say that those two really lived into their names. But they're in the book of Genesis. And by the way, if you want to follow along just a few minutes with this, what I'm going to be reading, I'm going to be on Genesis chapter 2. So Jacob was a lot like Johnny Cash's Sue. He became known as the deceiver. He grew into a man that was manipulative, a deceiver, and bullish. And for those of you who don't know the story about Jacob, I'm going to just explain it to you this morning. It's an important story for you to understand because, as I say every week, you can find yourself in a Bible character. I think we can all find ourselves in the lessons of Jacob. Now, his early years, they were marked by, by cunning and deception. Esau came in one day, he was hungry, and Jacob tricked him into giving up his birthright for a bowl of soup. And then later, working with his mother, they helped trick the dying father, Isaac, into giving his birthright to Jacob and not Esau, the older son. And they were so conniving, they actually put fur on his arms and around his neck, so when his blind father reached out to give him a blessing, he would think it was Esau. In short, Esau lost his inheritance, his lands, the servants, the livestock, Everything he expected to be his blessing, Jacob stole it. What would you do if your brother stole everything you had? In those days, you didn't go to court for most things. So Jacob says, I'm going to kill you. So Jacob had to get out of town just as fast as he could. So I want you to imagine to yourself, Jacob is huffing and puffing. He's trying to get out of Canaan as fast as possible. And he might be running like this because I haven't described the characters to you yet. In the Bible, it describes Esau kind of like what we would call a manly man. He was a, a skilled hunter and a rugged outdoorsman and, and he thrived out in the wild and they described Jacob as a mama's boy who liked to cook. 
So here's Jacob on the run, and I suspect he's feeling pretty nervous right about now. He's traveling. He decides it's time to stop for a night. He stops at a place called Luz. Remember I told you? It's important to pay attention to the names. If there's a name in the Bible, figure out what it means. That word Luz, as it turns out, is associated with the hazelnut. And the hazelnut is known for being very, very hard on the outside, an incredibly hard nut to crack, but the inside there's this bright, rich, creamy kernel. And the Hebrews considered that it, it, it's a symbol for uh, resilience and transformation. So here's Jason, I'm sorry, Jacob in Luz. And what's he? Hard on the outside, a manipulator, a conniver, a deceiver, a supplanter. But inside, he's a mangled mess. He knows his brother Esau is after him. He knows how vulnerable he is. And it's night as it comes on and he falls asleep. This is when he has that famous dream called Jacob's Ladder. And if you want to read along with me, it's Genesis 28, verses 12 to 15. I'm not going to put the slide up. I like the description of this, so if you don't get distracted. Verse 12, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its tops reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will be spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob woke up, he was in awe. He knew that he was in the house of God. And he was also encouraged because he now had the confidence that he needed to travel that 500 miles to where his uncle lived. And so he set on out with a new confidence. But here's where the story gets really interesting. So Jacob arrives at at Haran with, you know, where his uncle lives, and, and he's, he's like Sue. Sue would travel from town to town with that chip on his shoulder, getting into fights. Jacob traveled with that burden of a reputation, deceiver, manipulator. But when he got to his uncle's hometown, no one knew anything about him. All they knew about him, he was a young, wimpy boy from Canaan running from his brother for some reason. Before long, Jacob, he falls in love with his cousin, Rachel, madly in love, gets permission to get married. But the uncle says, you have to wait seven years. You've got to work for me for seven years. You do that, then you can marry my daughter. So he, he starts working really hard. He does everything he's supposed to be doing. And after seven years of hard work on his wedding night, Laban, his uncle, tricks Jacob into marrying his other daughter, Leah, Rachel's sister. Sound familiar? Sounds like he got what was coming to him. But Jacob, he still wanted to marry Rachel. He was in love with Rachel, and he says, seven more years. So Jacob agreed, and he stays seven more years, and, and after 14 years of, of hard work, he's built up a wonderful family. He's ma managed to amass a great wealth, even though his Uncle Levin tries every trick he can to manipulate and take his money from him. Life is good for Jacob, but like every story of a boy that leaves home, 
He wants to go home. He wants to see his mom. But he's got a problem, doesn't he? Esau. Esau probably still wants to kill him. But he heads out anyway. As he's making his way to Canaan, he starts sending messengers out to Esau and he's sending gifts. He says, hey, brother, I'm coming. Can we be friends? But the closer and the closer they get to the homeland, the more anxious Jacob grows. His anxiety is through the roof. And finally, when he gets to Jabbok River, he gets ready to cross the river. He gets word that Esau is on his way with 400 men. So he takes his family. He divides them. He has them cross the river in different directions. Hopefully, they don't get caught up in a battle. So there he is. He's alone. And then something really crazy happens. So we'll go to our scripture from this morning, Genesis 32, 24 to 27. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled him with him until daybreak. Okay, so it's pitch black outside. He probably can barely see this fingers at the end of his hands. It's so dark. And out of nowhere, he's blindsided, knocked over to the ground, and now someone is wrestling with him. And at first, he doesn't know who this is. So he started fighting like the way he would fight if he could fight. And it says that when the man saw that he couldn't overpower him, see, J Jacob was digging into his Nature, the conniver, the deceiver, the destruct, whatever I need to do to survive mode. He wasn't going to let himself be bested. So the man touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled the man. Jacob had his hip socket dislocated and he still kept fighting. He kept holding on, he kept wrestling. And the man said, let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man said, what's your name? So Jacob told him, deceiver, manipulator, surplanter, opportunist. Jacob, he answered, And the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it's because I saw God face to face, and yet he spared my life. Jacob came face to face with the almighty God, the, the father of, of Abraham, the God of Abraham and Isaac. He wrestled with him. But during that wrestling match, he was not going to let go of God until God gave him a blessing, not the blessing he stole from Isaac. The Isaac that was supposed to go to Esau and he stole from Isaac and he says, I want a new blessing, Father. I want a new name. I don't want to be the deceiver anymore. Don't we all struggle with God? Aren't we all that description, Israel? The one who struggles with God. Remember how that song, A Boy Named Sue, ended? He finds his father and they get into a knockdown, drag out wrestling match. And in the end, they stand up and he calls him Pa, and the other one calls him Son. 
I don't think Johnny Cash intentionally wrote a song about Jacob wrestling with God. Who knows? He was a religious man. But the moral is the same. Jacob learns that God isn't some distant, unmoved mover. God's a personal God who sought him out to rescue him. Sometimes, like it or not, it can be hard having a relationship with the Lord. Sometimes we get into struggles and we wrestle with God because we're thick-headed. We're too busy defending our reputations that we've accumulated. Wrestling with your faith isn't comfortable. And it requires perseverance. It requires honesty. It requires a willingness to eagerly deepen things and accept things that you don't understand. How many of you have wrestled with God? Perhaps you've faced career challenges or relationship issues or questions about who you are and what your purpose in life was. And maybe you dealt with health concerns or financial strain. Are you living your life because of a name, a trait, or a characteristic that defines you. When you're a kid, did they call you a loser, a dropout, or say you're never going to make it? So you never expected your life to be any different than that? Or maybe they called you the bully, arrogant, and God's blessing. The Apostle Paul was formerly known as Saul of Taurus. He wrestled with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about this burden that he carried. It says, but he says, he called it the thorn in his side. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast of all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God didn't grant Saul relief from the thorns in his side. But he gave him a new name. He changed his name from Saul to Paul, which means small and humble. There was nothing small about the things he did. See, this is the promise that we hold on to. God can take our past, our struggles, our failures, and he can transform them into something beautiful. How many times have you let your struggles define you? I'm a cripple. I have trouble speaking. I have anxiety in crowded places. I have diabetes. I can't make it to church. You let your condition, your state, define your spirituality. If we cling on to the negative labels that we give ourselves, then we limit the ability of God to do his work in us. Just as Jacob was renamed Israel after his struggles, we too can experience a divine renaming. Imagine the power of God's grace breaking through the chains of those labels. God wants to call you beloved. He wants to call you redeemed. He wants to call you forgiven. He wants to call you the child of a king. Let's invite God into our struggles. Let's allow him to redefine us. He's waiting there with open arms. 
He's ready to help us let go of the past. He's waiting to help us embrace that future of hope and purpose. And we can believe in his promises. Because he had a son that he loved, who he sent into this world, who was called names, who was persecuted, who was beaten, who was imprisoned, who was put on a cross and died for our sins so that we can live an abundant life with an eternal new name. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting us take this moment to do a survey of ourselves, the opportunity to say, what am I doing? Why am I beating myself up? Lord, help me work through my dysfunction with who I am, knowing that I am your, a child of God. I am the supreme possibility of all things possible, yet here I chain myself to this mortal world by the things that I'm called and the limitations I have when I know that I will live forever in eternity with you. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for motivating us. And let us continue to live fully in your name and for your son who died for us. Amen. Amen.